So at 13 years old, I had a, uh, <laughs> I had a kill list. I gotta hunt them down. Now you got a problem. That's right. I don't think I've ever said this before. Seriously. Seriously. This is gonna be fun. Michael in particular, he become my big brother. The greatest of all time. Oh, we call him Black Jesus. You're not intimidating me. We're gonna go at it. It's crazy. Yeah, man. You're about to take your shot and then all of a sudden, boom. The kiss of death. Man, my back was really spasming. How the hell do you tolerate that kind of pain? I play games with the flu. I play games with 102 degree fever, man. Powerful. Hey. Man. They all thought I was absolutely crazy the day me and Shaq got in a fist fight. <laughs> fist fight? Oh, yeah. Fist oh, fight. I'm not backing down. Listen, hey, dude, you got to throw me the ball. I said, man, fuck that. Get it off the rebound if I miss, bro. <laughs> you told them this. It doesn't bother you. I'm fine, dude. What the hell do you want me to do? Got it. Here's who tonight's speaker is. You ready? Before I introduce him, I want to tell you what some of his accomplishments are. Hang on. I got to tell you some of the things he's done. After the first one, you're going to know who it is. And if you're jacked up about it, I want you to holler and bring this building down. You ready? Let me say who it is first. First sentence. Ready? You got your lives on. You ready? He is the greatest Laker of all time. Five-time champion. The only guard to play with one team for 20 years. More 40-point games than LeBron and KD. Let me just say this, guys, more 40-point games than LeBron James and Kevin Durant. More 50-point games. More 50-point games than LeBron, Kevin Durant, and Steph Curry combined. And more 60-point games than LeBron James and Michael Jordan combined. Give it up to the one, the only, Kobe Bryant. Man. All right. Now, this is this is a company. This is a company. This is a company. Come <laughs> on. It's awesome. Wonderful. So you know, I gotta tell you guys. I gotta tell you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, we got to try to get through this interview in 60 minutes. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things a lot of you guys don't know. Let me get your attention. Let me get your attention. Settle down. Settle. You can stay where you are, but just settle down. Just don't make a lot of noise so we can enjoy the interview. I get it. Settle down. So, you know, one of the things most of you guys don't know, uh, we were in the back. Mario was asking me a question. Mari asked me a question and says, what do you think about when you think about Kobe? And I said, the first thing that comes to my mind is my dad. He says, why your dad? I said, because, <laughs> you know, he's born August 23rd, uh, 78. Yeah. I'm October 18, 78. So you're six right. and a half, seven weeks older than me. Right. So when he came to the lake, I've been a diehard Laker fan since, uh, you know, 1990 when I came to the States yeah. from Iran. And I'll never forget this. We would sit there and watch the game together. My dad and I would watch you play. And one day, Lakers are playing against the uh, 76ers. And it's game one. If you know my dad, you know he's had a lot of heart attacks. <laughs> We're watching game one. Iverson hits the shot over uh, uh, Ty, Ty Lue, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Game ends, they win the game, first game. My dad gets up and my dad says, Patrick, take me to the hospital. We went straight to the hospital because he was having heart issues. So that's how much we go back watching you grow up. You know, All right, man. It was amazing doing what you did Thank for you. one organization for 20 years. But, you know, before we get into it, before we get into it and kind of talk about what you're working on today and some of the mental toughness stuff here, if I was in high school with you, if I was in high school with you, yeah. outside of your game, mm -hmm. outside of you playing ball, Mm -hmm. Who was Kobe Bryant as an individual and personality in high school? If we were in high school together. Um, much the same that I am now, actually, which is extremely curious. Extremely curious. I had a great teacher in high school. Her name is Jane Mastriano, who I'm still, I'm still very close to. And she sparked my curiosity in writing. And the reason why I felt it was important at the time was not for the writing's sake, or not for storytelling purposes, but there are things in story, inherently in story, that can help me be a better basketball player, be a better teammate, a better leader, understand emotions better. So that's why I got into it, into storytelling, actually. So it's just in insanely curious, man. And, um, you know, trivial things weren't going to pull my attention. It had to be things, weren't going to pull my attention. It had to be things that were, I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old. That's you the deal I made. You were crystal clear about it. Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game. The love of the game. The challenge. Like, I, I would watch Magic play. I'd watch Michael play. And I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Let's find out. And so that curiosity to see where I could push this thing led me down that path, I think. Led you down that path? I think so. Now, were you, were you always competitive from the day you were born? You were super competitive? Uh, competitive with things that I, I participate in. So, I, like, I'll put it to you this way. So, like, you know, Michael is competitive in all things, things that don't make sense. Right? Ping pong. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Like, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, like, he would try to get me to play golf all the time. Mike, I know about you. I've written books, report about you in, like, elementary school. Like, I know you started playing golf when you were in Carolina. So that means if I'm doing the math, you've been playing golf for, like, 100 fucking years. <laughs> um, I have not picked up a golf club. Ever. Ever. The last thing you're going to do is get me on a golf course and annihilate me. I'm not going to do it. You've never picked up a golf club? No, I did it one time, and I was hitting, like, 400-yard grounders. Grounders. And so it got my competitiveness going. Like, I got to learn this game. But then I broke my finger during that year, and then I couldn't, That's couldn't it. play much, and that was it. So, so the one thing when I uh, uh, see with you, and I think about, like, brain, and I think focus. Like, you know how so many different things brain can get distracted on, and I'm going to put focus on this and focus on this and focus on this. Mm -hmm. Do you think one of the edge you had over everybody else was the biggest percentage of your focus was on one thing. Mm -hmm. Do you see it that way? Like, that was my edge over everybody else. Uh, I do. Um, at the time, I didn't really understand that, right? So, you know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player, everything. Everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. The world becomes your library to help you improve your craft, better yes. your craft. Yes, indeed. So because you know what you want, the world's giving you exactly the information you 100%. need to become better at it. Because you know what you're looking for. Yeah. So would you, when you, when you size your peers up, how'd you size your peers up? Like if you're sizing people, I'm talking you're 13 years old, you're sizing peers up, what lens are you looking through your peers? So at 13 years old, I had, a, um, <laughs> I had a kill list. And so, you know, they used to do these rankings. It was Street and Smith basketball rankings. And I was nowhere to be found because I was like 6'4", scrawny, like 160 pounds soaking wet. So I was like 57 on the list. And so I will look at 56, 55, all the way up to number one, who these players are, what club teams they played for. So when we go on an AAU travel circuit, I, I got to hunt them down. 
right? And so that became my mission in high school, is to check off every other person, all those 56 other names, hunt them down and knock them down. That was it. Get a target on them right off the bat. That was it. Very simple. That's unbelievable. Let me, let me ask you this question. You say, say I'm one of the guys on that list ahead of you and we play. What are you doing to get a feel? Is it, is your mind like, are you asking, let me see if this guy's better than me in this side and this side and this side? Or are you just going saying, I'm going to kill this guy? Well, it depends what year. So like in, at 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was to be better than you when, you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when we played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else, right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it, right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths. I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you gonna get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you want to win. Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. Right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. Mm. Now you got a problem. That's right. You got a problem. And you, caught, and you saw that. You got a problem. And by the way, uh, l- let me ask you. So that's high school. You go into the league. When you're going into the league, you're going with a lot of guys that were, you know, same age, same, age, you know, same class as you were going in. Yeah. Were you sizing those guys up the same exact way as you did in high school? I did. But, you know, in the NBA, <clears throat> it was actually easier. Because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability. So therefore, the passion and the work ethic and the, obsession, the obsessiveness was gone. So I'm looking at that. I'm like, oh, my God, it's going to be like taking candy from a baby. And I wonder Mike wins all these fucking championships. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Of and, 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 like, and, and then you had the players that had that passion but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice, right? You have other things. You have family. You have all these other things that you have to do. The game can't really be your number one priority. And so I was just looking at that like, man, I'm, this is going to be fun. In the muse, in the muse, you said, I knew you couldn't do what I was doing because I was obsessed. I'm paraphrasing. And then you said, whether it's friends, relationship, it didn't matter. It was all basketball. Yeah. If, if I'm buddies with you from high school, if I'm a cousin of yours, what happened to our relationship? How, how did that gravitate when you went into the league and you're, you're determined to become the greatest or you're determined to become one of the greatest? What happens to our relationship? Oh, it suffers. It does suffer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because and they, you understood that. You well, were okay well, yeah. with that. Well, yeah. And, and the people that love you, like friends and family, like they know that about you. Got it. So they let you be you. And when you reconvene, you know, you pick back up where you left off, Mm -hmm. but make no mistake about it, everything in between is lost, right? So those long-term relationships, the commitment of time of, uh, you know, uh, taking vacation, like I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends. And they'll just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, I never did that. But why it was a why choice. not though? Why, why, why didn't you do that? What? Well, because when I retire, I didn't want to have to say, I wish I would have done more. I don't want that. You know? I don't want that. So, okay, so you come in. It's, it's very powerful what you just said. Some of your peers were in it for the money, so they got the money. Okay, great buy a house for my mom, dad wanted that car, get this, get that, have fame, go to different cities, I'm partying, I'm doing all this other stuff. Who were some of the guys that you saw and you watched that weren't just driven by the money? Were there some names that you looked at and says, these three guys are as crazy as I am? I do, I, I, at the time I deal with what I've referred to as Goat Mountain. I went to Goat Mountain and I talked to Magic, Michael, Bird, Kim Olajuwon, Jerry West, 
Oscar Robinson, Bill Russell, you know. So I would talk to them. What did you do? What were your experiences? Michael in particular, he's become my big brother. He's been my big brother since I first came in the league. And what was that process like? And so I went to them and started understanding the ins and outs of the game and you know, how they approach things and their level of detail and obsessiveness. And, um, and that's what I did. Well, why do you think, uh, and first of all, let me ask how it felt, but I'm curious to know why you think as well. How did it feel knowing like from the moment you got into the league, the guy at the time is the greatest of all time. Everybody wants to be like my Gatorade, all this stuff. The level of respect he had for you when he spoke about you was different than everybody else. And you're an 18, 19 year old kid at that time. Yeah. How did that feel when you heard how he spoke about you? It, it made me feel good, but <laughs> no, like what I told him, I was like, you didn't say anything I didn't already know, so. You know, so like, when, <laughs> I tell you, like when, we, when I was in high school, um, and uh, I used to work out with the 76ers, I used to ask him, you know, what's it like to guard Mike? You go, Mike? You mean black Jesus? I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? Black who? Oh, well, we call him black Jesus. Or you can call him black cat. I'm like, I'm going to call him fucking Mike. That's his fucking name. So the level of fear that he inspired in others was insane. Wow. And I would tell him, I said, when I face him, we're going to go at it. He says, oh, you don't want to do that. I'm like, what? Man, you don't know me, man. And so when we matched up, I think he understood that. And, you know, when I was 18, my first year, he got the best of me a bunch of times. I was right there the next play. You're not intimidating me. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And I think he saw that level of respect because I think he was the same way at 18 years old. And that common bond is, is what I think, uh, you know, where our connection was built. Yeah, it was great watching you guys going back and forth, whether it was the All-Star game or whether the famous scene where, you know, you're guarding him, he's in front of you, you're asking him a question, there's a question, and he's saying footwork and do this. Yeah. It's just beautiful watching that take place with the two of you guys. How's your relationship today? Oh, it's my big brother, man. Like, I can't, you know, it's, um, we talk often. We send each other Christmas cards every year. Send each other Christmas cards. Every year <laughs> um, that we have nothing to do with, but, you know, yet and still, you know. Um, but we're extremely close, man. Extremely? Extremely close. That's extremely great. That's close. great. Yeah, you know, it's, it, 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 as a fan, I'm not in your world. Your world is a whole different world. I just see it from a fan, and I just see it from what experts say. But... As a fan, I feel that's exactly how it would be with you and him because the level of respect from both yeah. sides is reciprocal. And it's great to hear that. Um, going a little bit past it, you know, you came into the league, you start playing. First year, you get traded for Divac, which we were devastated when we lost Vlade Divac. I want you to <laughs> Heartbroken. <laughs> but we lost Divac. Okay. I think he got the sarcasm. Some of you guys who don't know basketball, you missed that one. You got one like this. But Kobe shows up. I mean, I'm like a kid in a candy store. When you show up, I'm like, oh, we, no more Sedale treats. We're going to get some real players. <laughs> Nothing against these guys, but we wanted some entertainment, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you show up and you play, and there was the one game. I think you started getting a little bit more playing time. I think you did 7.2 points a game because they won't let you play. The coach was just not putting you in there. Yeah. Second season was like 15. I, I bet if you take your first three and you played college, your 25.4 would probably would be a 26.5, 26.6 type of a number. Yeah. But your first three seasons, then the one game, it's the last game of the season you play Utah. Yeah. The one where you shoot three air balls at the end. Five. It was like five. And then you it's hit crazy. one and his them doesn't go in, right? Mm -hmm. Moses, not Malone, one of the Malones came and spoke to you. I don't know who it was from the Jazz. Malone, he was, yeah. He was saying something. You yeah. were not even paying attention. Shaq was whispering something in your ear. What did Shaq say to you in that moment? I don't even know. You don't remember? No, I wasn't paying attention. Got you it. know, like, like it, it was, you know, like for me, it, it's... Maybe it's a little, like, asshole of me or whatever, but whatever. Um, he was, like, he was trying to whisper encouraging things. I was like, I'm fucking fine. <laughs> okay. I, I shot five air balls on national TV in front of millions of people. That cost us a series. And I'm 18. I'm fine, dude. How do you get their <laughs> mental? How does somebody get there mentally with that 
public humiliation to some people, hurts them, and they don't come back because, you know, there was a player, Barbosa. I don't know if you remember Barbosa. Yeah. Of course you remember him. Of course. He was extremely talented for a quick first step, but they said he wouldn't do well when the spotlight was on him. Yeah. How did you get mentally and emotionally so strong where it doesn't bother you? Well, you know, it's, you got to look at the reality of the situation. You know, like for me, it's not, you know, you, you kind of got to get over yourself. Like, it's not about you, man. Like, oh, okay, you feel embarrassed. You're not that important. Like, <laughs> get over yourself. Yeah, that's where you go. Get over yourself, right? Like, you're worried about how people may perceive you, and, like, you're walking around, and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls. Get over yourself, right? And then after that, it's okay, well, why did those air balls happen? Got it. High school, year before, we played 35 games, max, right? Week in between, spaced mm -hmm. out plenty of time to rest. In the NBA, it's back to back to back to back to back to back to back. I didn't have the legs. So you look at the shot, every shot was online. Every shot was online, but every shot was short. Right? I got to get stronger. God. I got to train differently. The weight training program that I'm doing, I got to tailor it for an 82-game season mm. so that when the playoffs come around, my legs are stronger and that ball gets there. So I look at it with rationale. And say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I got well, next year they'll be there. That was it. Done. Done. And then w what is your process of improvement with your schedule leaving? Because, you know, Phil Jackson gets asked between you and uh, MJ, right? Because he coached both of you guys. So, yeah. you know, he constantly gets asked that question. He's always going to pick the first child. He's, well, he's going to pick the first child. <laughs> but I tell you, <laughs> he said something about you that to me, uh, it's a level of respect that any player can duplicate what he said about you. To me, the level of respect for that is a whole different level. You can't teach big hands. Right. Right? You cannot right. teach that, right? Right. You cannot teach 49, 48 inch, whatever the vertical leap is, and hey, yeah. you cannot teach that, right? Sure. But he said nobody in his history of coaching had your level of work ethic. I mean, you hear so many, William, so many guys tell stories about your work ethic. Yeah. What was really your work ethic like, and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day. I mean, since, you know, for 20 years. I mean, it was an everyday process in trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Man, my vertical was a 40. It wasn't a 46 or a mm -hmm. 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive, right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm. and it just never changed. Technical question here. Let's sure. see how you can answer this. Who would Shaq be if he had your work ethic? He'd be the greatest of all time. If Shaq had your work ethic, he'd be the greatest of all greatest time. Greatest of all time by For sure. He, he'd be the first to tell you that. For sure. I mean, this guy was a, a force like I have never seen. I mean, it was crazy. You know, a guy at that size, generally guys at that size are a little timid and they don't want to be tall. They don't want to be big. Man, this dude was... He did not care. He was mean. He was nasty. He was competitive. He was vindictive. I mean, he was, yeah. I wish he was in a gym. I would have had fucking 12 rings. If he had the work ethic. My God, yeah. We ain't be close. Wow. And, and let me ask you, let me ask you this question. And by the way, I'm not asking this question to create feud between you and him. You, you I don't care, you bro. Listen, me, I'm me and Shaq talk, question. sit down all the time, and I say, dude, if your lazy ass is in this, shape. I hear you saying all the time, and he oh, takes I, it. I tell him all the time. I'm asking this question for a different reason. I'm asking this question because, look, we, we've grown as a company extremely fast. We went from one office with 66 agents to 10,900 offices, 800, 10,900 agents in 49 uh, states, and we're the fastest growing insurance company now. But I say this, I say it for one reason. And by the way, this message is directed to a lot of you, so hear me out very simply. The fact that you say the work ethic side, yeah. the fact that you say work ethic side, and you say, hey, if he would have wor worked that hard as I did, do you think if he would have had the same level of commitment to the game as you did, you guys would have had fewer feuds between each other? 
Yeah, because I, I, listen, I don't, I don't deal with people that don't commit at that level, but then act as if they do. I don't deal with that. I don't. It's real shit. I mean, I listen. So, like, we, we, we used to get into stuff all the time because it was like, you know, he would say, okay, Kobe's not throwing me the ball. And, you know, media would take it and run with it and all sort of stuff. And I'm like, well, bruh, if you were in shape, by the time I run down on a fast break and run back and then run down, you're still coming down the first time, bruh. Like, what the hell do you want me to do? Right? So a lot of our contention came, came from, from that. that. Came from that. And even though he was older, you were still confronting him. You didn't, you didn't care. Oh, I didn't care. Part. Man, from listen. From day one? Bro. Listen, from we, day one. I, I knew for sure Rick Fox, my teammates, they all thought I was absolutely crazy the day me and Shaq got in a fist fight. After that day, they were like, okay, Kobe, you're certifiable. Uh, <laughs> fist fight. Oh, yeah. Fist fight. Oh, I'm not backing down. Listen, either you're going to whoop my ass or I'm a, we're going to have a night. But, you know, <laughs> ain't no way. <laughs> Hey, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a level of respect. And, and for Shaq, too, by the way, that, I know he, he's told me that that day was a big turning point for him because it was like, you know, he's generally used to talking trash and saying what he wants and nobody really stepping up and challenging him on that. And when he saw me challenge him on that, he was like, this kid's crazy. All right, I can win with that. You know, and so that was kind of the beginning of our relationship, I think. That's probably never happened to him. That's probably not something that's common to him. No. It, it, I mean, he's also, seven feet tall since he was three years old or something, right? There was all, <laughs> this is all coming back to me right now. It was also a game in Phoenix. My first year we were playing, and uh, he kept posting up. But they kept fouling him, so he kept going to the free throw line and kept missing him. And so he throw the ball out to me. I'm not throwing that shit back in there. <laughs> Right? So I kept shooting him, right? So we get in the timeout, and he's like, hey, hey, uh, hey, I'm open. I'm like, okay. And so we go out, and same thing, come, hey, 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 I'm open. Okay. There you go. <laughs> come back in, hey, dude, you got to throw me the ball. I said, man, fuck that. Get it off the rebound if I miss, bro. <laughs> you told him this. First year. 18 years old, man. 18 years old. <laughs> and I must have been out of my damn mind. <laughs> so, did, did you have guys you went to outside of the players? Like when you come in to figure out a way to improve your, uh, uh, your game. We had Billy Bean here a couple days ago, and I don't know if you know who Billy Bean is. If you've seen the movie Moneyball, he's the guy, Billy Bean. Of course. So he talked a lot about predictive analytics. He talked about the fact that the year Moneyball came out, the year prior to that, they paid players and looked at on-base percentage as eight stat. And the year Moneyball came out, all the scouts started making an on-base percentage number one, what sure. they recruited for, right? Did you have ways to improve your game by looking at data, looking at conditioning? What were some of the factors you looked at on how to improve your game season after season? Uh, the game itself was, it, it's, a, it's a complicated answer. So there, there are very tactical things in terms of footwork and geometry of the court. So you're looking at the court and looking at the 45 degree angles that the court is, is shaped in and how it needs to operate. That's one component to it. So looking at spots on the floor where you can increase your efficiency, right? You can be on the wing, but there's a certain spot on the wing that improves your angle to drive to the basket, right? So that sort of stuff. Footwork of the opposition, looking at the emotion of the opposition, their tendencies, their weaknesses, and all that stuff. Understanding the momentum of the game, how to create momentum shifts, where momentum shifts come from, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then studying outside of that, right? Looking at different industries, looking at uh, conductors, looking at writers, looking at actors and how they get into character and then how do they keep themselves in that mental space. So um, looking at different, different industries, looking at nature itself mm. and learning from that and how you can incorporate that into the game. It, I, I, man, it's, it's a lot of studying. What's your process for making a decision? Do you have a flow of how you go through making a decision? Uh, depends on the decision. Depends on the decision. If we're talking about, you know, a basketball decision where, you know, you've got to, um, you know, read a certain coverage or something like that. I mean, a lot of that comes from the, the pre-work, pre-work and understanding what their defensive package is and 
uh, how to put teammates in certain situations. So, for example, if you look at players nowadays that are charged with taking game-winning shots or making game-winning decisions, mm -hmm. and you look at the play and then you look at it and you say, okay, well, that shooter was there, the double team came, and, you know, the player couldn't do anything but pass the ball, right? Well, that's because they didn't do the pre-work. Right? So when you do the pre-work, you understand, okay, this team in this situation likes to run a double team from this particular angle. All right, so I'm gonna clear that side out, force the double team to come from a different angle, move myself to a space on the floor where it's gonna take a long time for the double team to come, and now I can circumvent the double team and get to a place on the floor where I can knock down a shot to get to the basket. So it's, it's all that pre-work. Decision, when I say decision, how is the, if you're looking at somebody that you're sizing up, or if you're looking at somebody to go into business with, or if you're looking at a big investments you got to make, what is the decision-making process there? Do you call? Is there first you do your own research, you take this much time, you call an advisor? Is there a, is there a system you no, follow? It's pretty, pretty simple for me. It's, it's do you understand the business? Is it a business that you can help in some form or fashion? What are the barriers of entry to that business? And then the entrepreneurs themselves, the company that itself. Right? Do they have a culture that you believe is sustainable? Are these leaders people that you believe in? Are they people that are obsessives? And in turn, have they created a culture of obsessiveness? So I tend to look at those four factors and that's it. That's, that's big right there, by the way. I don't know if you guys caught that right there. That's pretty massive right there. Um, earlier you said, I'm probably not going to get this right, a 16-year-old, a 13 or 11-year-old? Yeah, 13. 16, and, 13, two, and one that's a month. One that's a month, by the way, right? One that's a month. All girls. All girls, four, four, four. So 16 means you're in your fifth, sixth year, sixth year having a baby? Yeah. Is it something like that, right, give or take? What was the conversation like with your wife to say, listen, this is the schedule? Because, look, you know, some entrepreneurs, they're coming home at night and late, oh, my gosh, my wife is upset because I came home at 1130. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness, what a <laughs> sacrifice I'm making. You know, yeah, this life's, yeah. you know, I don't know if I can do this. Sure. You're on the road nine months out of the year. If you sure. especially played the Olympics, you won two gold medals, so you're doing that on the offseason and you're trying yeah. to get that part going and training for doing your camps. What is the conversational life like with your wife and kids to say, listen, this is what I'm doing. How did that conversation go? Well, with the kids, it's different. So, like, the communication with, the, with our children is that, you know, Pops is working hard. This is the level of attention to detail you need to have in everything you do. So it's, it's setting the example. Same thing with my wife. My wife's a stay-at-home wife. It's the hardest job, man. Right? So she works really hard at that. I mean, it's... You know, and so her attention to detail with that as well are examples for our children. And then for my wife, it's, you know, she's as competitive as I am. So she's like, listen, man, if you're going to be out here training eight hours a day, if you're going to spend nine months out of the year away from your family, you better fucking win the championship. <laughs> what are we doing this for? <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? I love that. You know? Um, but it's a balancing act, and that's the thing that's important is understanding that we have to have so much energy because for, like, Natalia and Gianna when they were babies, especially Natalia because they're doing prime years, um, and I'd go to practice and I'd, I'd train and, you know, I'd play the game and, you know, I'd come home and I'd be sore and I'd be tired, and she wants to go swimming, she wants me to take her to the park, she wants to just jump on my back or whatever the case may be, you can't say... I'm too tired, I'm going to lay down. Mm. That's not fair. She don't know what the hell's going on, right? And if this was a game, you'd suck it up and play. I play games with the flu. I play games with 102 degree fever, man. Power. You can't do that. That is can't. so powerful, right? man. You gotta be on, man. That's big. Did you guys, uh, um, would, you, would you sit at the, because you, you're obviously very detailed, your show. I mean, you're a very, very detailed guy. Would you guys have a meeting, like I sit there and say, okay, if, if, I'm Co if I'm thinking like Kobe, let's just say Kobe is trying to schedule out his year, season's about to start. Would you sit with her and say, okay, babe, this is the schedule next 12 months. Tell me about birthdays. Tell me about this. Yes. Tell me, is, that, is that what you guys do? Yeah, I look at it and say, okay, birthdays, what am I missing? 
uh, Valentine's Day, Halloween, Christmas, you know, Easter, like all that fun stuff. I look at the schedule and see what I'm there for, what I'm not there for. Christmas, is it a road game or a home game this year? And then we make a family decision, it's family travel, uh, do I come back? Like sometimes I'd, I'd fly back, like I'd play a game and to not miss my daughter's birthday, I'd fly back, be there for her birthday and then fly back with the team, you know, just to make sure I don't miss anything. Respect. What's the least amount of sleep you play the game on? No is there, sleep. Is there a story where it's like, you know, no one knows about where you went and played a game and it was so insane for whatever reasons? No sleep. I, <laughs> you played play a game, game with zero no, sleep. Zero sleep. Zero sleep. It's like, you know, um, kids, you know, Natalia had a certain, you know, health situation or what have you and you're staying up all night and then uh, you got to go out and perform because fans don't know. You know, the teammates don't know, nor do they care, nor should they, that you've been up all night. You got to perform, right? And so um, you just got you just got to go to work, man. That's respect. That's, That's it. respect. And, and, and I think one of the things that for, for, for some, if you follow basketball or not, that you and Mike had in common is that it wasn't, hey, I'm going to take eight games off this year to try to stay healthy. The mindset of no, you know, like that to you is comical, right, to do that. What the hell is that, man? I don't know what that is. That's crazy. Seriously, it's crazy. Like, you know, you, you got a lot of people playing their hard-earned money to come watch you perform. 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 It's your job to be in shape. It's your job to be strong enough to perform at that level every single night. And as a competitor, I'm not, I'm not ducking shit. Like, it's not, oh, my God, my back hurts. I'm sore. We got to play Vince Carter and Toronto Raptors tonight. We actually had this happen. We had a game against Toronto in 2000. Um, and Vince was tearing the league up. Um, my back was jacked, jacked. But like the perception of that, like what? Kobe's missing a game against Toronto and Vince Carter because man, my back was really spasming. But people would be like, what? Oh, he's ducking Vince. Excuse me? <laughs> no, I don't think so. So I would be in the layup line like, okay, there's a lot of days where, you know, you can rest and recover. Today ain't one of them. Your back can bother you any other day. That shit ain't bothering me today. Wow. We going he gonna have to see oh, me man. today. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was another one that came in. You thought for sure, you know, he was gonna be yeah. one of the in a whole different league when he came in. Obviously, he he just extra. I don't know what his vertical leap is. 46, 47 no, out of this world. What he does. The best dunker I've ever seen. Insanity is. Yeah, I mean, dude, dude. insanity is why they uh, call him that. So crazy. You're an alpha. You have a very strong personality, uh, uh, extremely strong personality. And then you got a team with Shaq, and then you got a team with Phil Jackson, and you guys are all working together. How was it taking coaching from an alpha and you're an alpha? And was there a progression of you finally understanding him or him understanding him? What did that look like, the relation between you and Phil? No, at, at first it was rocky, but I didn't understand it was rocky. And, and, and let me elaborate. I was extremely naive. And with Phil and his genius, his responsibility was to get the team to a place to win titles. It wasn't a piece to appease one player. It wasn't to look out for this player. It was to get the collective whole to win a championship. So he would do whatever it took to make sure that that happened. Mm. He would see the friction between myself and Shaquille and say, okay, how can I use that? All right, I know Kobe has a passion to play, so come hell or high water, doesn't matter what's going on in his personal life, doesn't matter what's happening here with the team, he's gonna show up and perform no matter what. Shaq is more emotional. If something's going on, he won't. So therefore, I gotta figure out how to create a wedge between myself and Cole, because then that brings me closer to Shaquille. And then that helps me better manage Shaq. So that was his ability to manage the team, which was absolutely brilliant. I used to tell him all the time, I said, Phil, look, I know what you're doing, bro. Like, don't insult my intelligence. I know you're being a dick to me on purpose. Like, just like, tell me. No, no, okay, you're gonna stick, stay with it. All right, cool, all right. <laughs> How's your relationship till today? I mean, you guys want five It's like together. a father figure. Really? Yeah, it feels like a father figure, man. So all, when you were hearing all the uh, uh, experts saying what they were saying, commentators saying what they were saying about Phil, how were you taking that when they were saying what they were saying about him with the, when he was at the Knicks? Um, I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. And I, I told Phil, I said, Phil, you know, this is all just karma. 
for writing literally three books about me. This is, <laughs> this is your karma. <laughs> um, you told him that. I did tell him that. <laughs> It was just all in good fun. Oh. Um, but I, I was upset because people don't understand him. And he is a genius in every sense of the word. And how he sees the game, how he sees the spirituality of the game. And people don't understand that. And worse than that, they're intimidated by that. And even worse, they try to discredit that because they do not have the level of passion and obsessiveness obsessiveness to get to that level. So they figured the best thing to do is to tear that level down. That's fucked up. I'm with you. They're 100% by the way. <clears throat> Obviously he had a lot of interesting rituals. You would hear about the yoga, you would hear about all the stuff that we, he would do. What is the weirdest thing he did with you in practice that you're like, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. He had a Tai Chi master come to practice. And uh, we walk out there and, you know, the Tai Chi master stands in center court and tells us to take our shoes off, take our shoes off. And I'm pissed because I'm, I'm ready to, like, play basketball. And he's standing up there and says everybody closes their eyes and stuff. And he does stuff like monk gazing at moon and talks about the fingertips and barely touching and the spirituality of all that. And I'm peeking around like, is everybody doing this shit? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on? And they're, you know, and big ass Phil, Phil's there doing it himself. He's like, you know, he's doing this whole, like doing all this stuff, you know? And I'm like, damn, okay, I'm gonna try it. But honestly, it, 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 I bought into it. I bought into the meditation. I bought into the deeper connection that exists within the game. And so when you watch our teams, or you watch any of Phil's teams, or Chicago teams, game six against Utah, you watch our games, you know, game seven against Boston, we were never rattled, ever, because we're always in the moment, always in the present, always extremely calm, always looking at the reality of the situation and not letting our emotions cloud our execution. And that comes from being in that meditative state that he would teach and preach from day one. W would he take you back? Would he take you back? Would he take you back and say you had a terrible game and it was, you know, the season prior? Would he take you back and say, we're going to watch this game. It was the worst loss we had. It was absolutely embarrassing for you to kind of see what things you did to improve. Was he that kind of a, was he? No. It was more about fundamentals and improving the game. Move on. He was very hands-off, right, in the sense of he allowed players to develop. He would allow you to find your truth and then go after it. And he was there to simply guide you along that journey, uh, which I actually learned from him, and that's how I parent. And that's how I coach my daughter's team now. So that's why I say he's a father figure, because I've learned so much from him as a coach that I take as a father, as a husband, and as a coach myself, but he was very, he was very observant. Was he a one on, better one-on-one -on -one or one-on-few? Like one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-12. Like if I'm having a team meeting and I'm talking to guys to rally them or calm them down or it's okay, strategy, or was he very good one-on-one, -on -one, just you and him closed doors? Yes, great conversationalist, uh, but hated confrontation. He hated confrontation. Direct confrontation is not his thing. Doesn't do it. Never did well with it. Had a lot to do with how he grew up and his, you know, his brother, his siblings, and father, and so forth and so on. Hates direct confrontation. And he knew that about himself. So that's why a lot of his challenges were indirect. He went to the media with things. So he's very indirect. He would never challenge a player directly. He's, he didn't like that. Yeah. He said one time, you guys had a meeting and he sat you down and shacked down and he says, listen, I know you guys think you're alpha. I'm a bigger alpha than the both of you guys. Did, did that ever take place? Was Not really. Not no, okay. it, 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 was, it was more like, uh, you know, he would say it in film sessions, not with me and Shaq. Like, he never sat me and Shaq down, like him, me, and Shaq. He never no, said that. No, God, no. You kidding? Why wouldn't he, though? Is it the confrontation? Yeah, I'm sure it'd be a little terrifying for him. Got it. <laughs> I mean, Phil, you've ever seen Phil walk? I mean, Phil, you know, he's got like one good hip on like the best day of his life. It's like if some shit goes down, he, he's doing <laughs> nothing to break that up. 
<laughs> so I'm assuming it's a little intimidating. But what he would do is he would do things indirect. And it wasn't about calming the waters. It was about stirring up the waters and creating a storm that eventually would lead this broken ship to the shore it was trying to get to in the first place. <laughs> so was he constantly instigating and steering in that's his own what, way? That's what he was doing, man. So like, if you've ever seen the movie Moana, if anybody has kids here, I'm sure you've seen Moana. Right? When she goes out and all of a sudden there's a storm and she loses her mind, thinks everything is lost, and all of a sudden she wakes up and she's right where she was supposed to be, that's Phil. Wow, that's a great example. <laughs> great example. So you, you, we're coming on to the last 15 minutes. I got a list of questions that I'm not going to get to, but I do want to ask a couple of these. Is you're playing against the Golden State Warriors. Score is 107-109. You guys are close to getting into the playoffs. You know exactly what happens in the game. You go up, you're about to take your shot, and then all of a sudden, boom, yeah. Achilles happens, right? Friend of mine, Nima, he is here just to listen to. He played ball. And he told me, he says, Patrick, I don't think you understand. He says, when I tore my Achilles in high school, <laughs> he says, four friends of mine dragged me to my hospital. <laughs> I was crying from there straight to the hospital. He says, I have no clue how the hell this guy did it. He went and hit the free throws, and then you walked off the stage, yeah. and then you got the surgery done. Yeah. How the hell do you tolerate that kind of pain? Uh, you know, I, I use this, I, I tell this example, and I think this is the best way to explain it. Um, you know, you have a, a hamstring injury, you pull your hamstring really, really badly, you can barely walk, right? Let alone play anything. Soccer, basketball, volleyball, whatever it is, you can't do anything. Doctor tells you go home, sit up on the couch, rest your hammy, right? Stay off of it, don't get up, no sudden movements. You're at home, all of a sudden a, a fire breaks out in the home, right? Your kids are upstairs, you know, wife is you know, wherever she may be, you know, this shit's going down, all right? I'm willing to bet that you're going to forget about your hamstring, you're going to sprint upstairs, you're going to grab your kids, you know, make sure your wife's good, you're getting out of that house, right? Hamstring be damned. You're not going to feel your hamstring, right? And, and the reason is because the lives of your family are more important than the injury of your hamstring. And so when the game is more important than the injury itself, you don't feel that damn injury. Mm. Not at that time. Yeah. So you go to the locker room. <clears throat> You guys had a shot that, you know, to go into the... You guys were a team that no one wanted to face, even though there was conflict. You know, maybe if you would have gone round one, who knows? Maybe Dwight would have gone together, you know. Who knows what was going to happen? Sure. It's just, you were the kind of team that, look, it's just the pain in about to face these guys. We're sure. just hoping you don't make the playoffs, right? I'm sure a lot of people were very happy that you guys didn't make the playoffs that year. But you go into the locker room, and then one of the reporters comes up to you, and he says to you, Kobe, are you convinced that they told you it's probably torn Achilles. They're going to do an MRI. Are you pretty convinced that's what it is? And your answer is, yeah. Then one of the reporters says, but if anyone is going to get through this, it's probably you, right? You put your head down and you say, oh, man, shit, right? And you have tears in your eyes. Yeah. Did you say, oh, man, shit, because everybody's <laughs> expecting me to be invincible, man. Like, freaking let me just play the damn <laughs> game. I'm a human being. Is that kind of what you were thinking or was it like, the world's expect me to come back in the next month because I'm Kobe. Like, what were you thinking in that no, moment with all that pressure? I was thinking, like, I don't know if I can do this. Dude, wow. Achilles were like the kiss of death yes. for athletes. Like, yes. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. There's so many factors. There's the surgery that has to take place. The surgery has to go well, right? And then just it's a tendon. I'm not dealing with anything that's muscular or things that I can control. I can't control a tendon. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I don't know. And then thinking about what that process of recovery is going to mm -hmm. look like. It's a long one. Do I want to do that shit? I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to do it. I don't know. So that was the hardest part. You, you don't know if you want to do it or you don't know if you are going to be able to come back from it? Both. Oh, like, both I don't know them. if I can do it. I don't know if I want to do it. Got it. I mean, it's, it's a long, long yes. process. But, like, 
when I, I went in the trainer's room, my kids are in there. And, you know, they're looking at you and stuff. And I'm looking at them. And I'm like, you know, it's all right. Dad's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. It'll be fine. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. As a parent, you got to set the example. You got to set the example. This, this is another obstacle. This obstacle cannot define me. It's not going to cripple me. It's not going to be responsible for me stepping away for the game that I love. I'm going to step away on my own terms. And that's when the decision was made that, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You're a freaking beast, bro. Yeah, hey. I notice a lot of times you go and you talk about, like, the, even the example you use right now, if your hamstrings are this, you're down, your wife's upstairs, your kids, you ain't going to think about it. You're gonna, so did you have a lot of these scenarios where you used your wife and your kids to use as no excuse, I'm going to get through this? Was that a mental conversation you had that nobody could hear? Yeah, you got to lead by example. As parents, you got to lead by example. If you want your kids to do whatever it is they want to accomplish in life, you have to show them. Mm. You can't. You got to show them. And that's what I tried to do. And you're obviously doing that, man, at a whole different level. I try. Alter ego. Let's do alter ego, and then I want to kind of go into the story side and how you went into the storytelling. And you went and get it. Guys, this guy won an Academy Award. He's a basketball player. <laughs> how the hell does that make any sense, right? <laughs> Wins a freaking Academy Award, right? <laughs> so alter ego. Alter ego. You know, sometimes uh, 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 we are so worried about what other people think about us. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, what if they think I'm crazy? What if they think I'm over obsessive or competitive? And what if this is like, you're too much. This is just not healthy for you to be thinking this way, right? Yeah. How did you get your mindset into this alter ego to be comfortable being Black Mamba? Like, how, how did that happen? It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally, to be able to put myself in a place where at practice or when I'm training or during games, I switch my mind to something else. I switch my mode into something else, right? For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt, it's go time, right? So that was my mental switch. It was like an actor getting ready for a film. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. And then when you leave there, it's something completely different. But when I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me. Don't talk to me. <laughs> Just leave me alone. I, there used to be certain games, like, for, like, certain key games. Uh, I don't think I've ever said this before. This, this kind of makes me seem very psychotic, but whatever. I used to uh, play the Halloween theme song over and over and over in my headphones. Pre-game. Seriously. 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 And it was important that it was Michael Myers because the mask itself was void of emotion. Void of emotion. It has That's nothing to do with pressure. It has level. nothing to do with hype. It has nothing to do with camaraderie. It's stone cold killer. And I would listen to that song over and over and over. Wow. To get, that's, that's when you know... You better run, because... <laughs> That's what a lot of people did. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> coming out. You know, it's going to be a tough night. Story. Yeah. So, Kobe, you've probably made, in this 50-minute conversation, I don't know, 12 metaphors. So, typically, people that make metaphors, they're storytellers. To them, everything has to paint a picture. And from the day one, you're talking about you were very curious, right? So, when you finished the last game you had, and I'll never forget, we were having a training, by the way, in Dallas, and we finished it. This was three years ago, and my sister and I get home. It's 12.30. I was hoping I could catch the game. It's your last game. You're playing Utah. Yeah. And uh, I'm standing up the entire time. I'm getting the last four minutes, which is the best freaking four minutes. <laughs> and I see you, Shaq, saying, go for 50, and then you... You're just going, and, and you're not hitting easy shots. These are not easy shots. Right. You hit your last shot. You scored six. Guys, nobody has ever had a 60-point game to retire with. Like, <laughs> that has never happened. Like, it's insane <laughs> for this to happen. You hit your 60-point. I got to say this. My sister's in the room. Kobe, I got tears coming down and watching you when this happens because 20 years I've been following this guy, and... I relate to you because in the insurance world, I take a lot of your uh, uh, similarity. You may be in a complete different world. I'm looking at the world here, and it's just like seeing this guy. He's so freaking determined to say, I came and gave everything I had, and I'm going to give it to the last freaking second. That's what you did. But then you leave, and you're like, no, it's good. I'm cool. 
You tell your story, you give your message, everybody's flipping out. And you're like, no, nah, Kobe's going to come back. No, Kobe, and then you go in and you go into your storytelling and all this stuff. How did that disconnect and going into that going? You're still helping out a lot of players. You're sure. always advising Laker. You know, Jeannie calls you. Anybody calls you, you're helping out, no problem. Sure. But how did that adjustment go from there to all of a sudden? Man, I got to go tell stories. Yeah. How did that happen? Because I love it. So, you know, it started for me again in high school when I started learning about storytelling, writing, how to structure a story, how to put together, how to thread together a narrative that has a bigger message, how to create compelling characters, how to take some of the emotions from my, from my own journey and instill them into characters that inspire or teach the next generation. Therefore, they can avoid some of the pitfalls and landmines that I had to go through. Right? That's something I'm extremely passionate about. So I loved it. So it wasn't a matter of, man, I got you know, to put this aside. I got to move on to something else. I was excited. So, man, I can't wait to get started. I can't wait to move on and do something else. And everybody kept saying, man, like, it, <laughs> my wife asked me one time, we were filling out a form for school. And it said, all right, father, occupation. And she's like, <laughs> what, am I, what am I supposed to put down? You know, I don't know, storyteller. You want me to write storyteller on your kid's form? Wow. You know, yeah, I guess. I mean, that's what I'm doing. Because... Dude, really? All right, fine, just put producer, I don't know, right? But during that year, everybody kept coming up to me and saying, okay, you're going to have stages of grief when you retire. You're going to go into a state of depression when you retire. And those are all normal and all this other stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm fine. Yes, of course you would say that. I said that too. I'm like, dude, fuck, man. And so after a while, I just started listening like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. And, you know, and then my competitive, competitiveness inside was like, no, I'm going to do something in the next 20 years that is better than these last 20. You might not understand that. I'm doing that, <laughs> you know, you know. So the competitiveness kicks in. You've gone. Same determination. What's your current work schedule look like today? It's, it's, uh, it's different because I personally am not writing every word of the novels. I am not animating the films. What I have to do now is make sure that the people that we bring in, these obsessives that we bring in, are challenging themselves to do the best job that they think they can do. That's what I'm there for, is for them to constantly look in the mirror and self-assess and challenge themselves. If we have a project and you're saying, okay, I can do that, that's not the project we want. The projects that say, I don't know if I can animate that. I don't know how to write that story. I don't know how to do that. Those are the things we want because through that curiosity, you'll reach a level that you didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. And so running the studio, that's what I'm doing. Are you, are you a big movie guy? You're huge. Okay, so how, how do you watch movies? Like, you know, I, I, my experience is people watch movies in many different ways. Not everybody watches movies the same way. When you're watching movies, how are you watching a movie? I watch them multiple times and I wear different hats every time. So the first time I watch it, I watch it just as a fan for pure entertainment value. Then I watch it from the director's lens and see why he made some of the decisions or she made some of the decisions that she made mm -hmm. for the film. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the lighting. Lighting? Oh, yeah. Like lighting is extremely important. Of course. Oh, yeah. Then, that then I listen to the music. And then you can challenge yourself by really understanding the director's point of view if you watch a film without music and without sound. Then you can actually see the film for what it is. So I watch it at different, different stages. I mean, obviously, uh, Academy Awards that you won, the gentleman you hired for the sound, wasn't it John? Is it, uh, uh, John Williams. John yeah, Williams, did the music. right? And John yeah. Williams is like the GOAT he's, in his world. Bro, he's the modern-day Beethoven. Yeah. And this guy, I mean, this guy's composed any song right now that you can remember from a film, he's done. Superman theme, did that. Indiana Jones, did that. Jaws, did that. Harry Potter, did that. The Olympics theme, did that too. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. 
And, you know, he's like 85 years old. That's crazy. Yeah, man. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, That's he's, pure he's doing a new Star Wars film now. Oh, Star Wars too, that part. <laughs> he did that one too. Yeah. So when you say recruiting and putting your team together with your projects today, who, who are you recruiting? Like, you know, if you're putting a basketball team together, you need a GM, president, you know, trainers, all this stuff, assistant, good coach. What do you need right now when you put like, it For example, right now, building out an animation house. Right, so you got to start with the head of the snake. You got to look at the person that better understands the type of animation that you want to create. And they have to be obsessives, have to have a knowledge base, a historical knowledge base, because I love people that understand the history of their industry, ins and outs of it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you bring that person into the picture, and then you allow them to do what you brought them in to do. So you leave them alone, kind of like Phil left you guys alone to do. I'm not going to hire you to tell you how to do your job. Got it. So recruiting, obviously in the league, you were known as a great recruiter. So what is your recruiting approach? So if you're sitting down with me, I'm somebody you really want, you really want me on the team. What's your approach to recruit me? You want first place, come play with me. You want second place, go somewhere else. <laughs> This is too much fun here. <laughs> Final thoughts, man. What are we going to see uh, uh, with Kobe next 20 years? What other projects you got in mind that you're working on right now? Uh, the biggest challenge for us is looking at the entertainment industry and how to diversify it, uh, particularly in animation, but also in writing, in, in, in young YA novels, middle grade novels, how to create more diverse characters, how do we have better representation, how do we create better opportunities, not just and ethnicity, but also gender diversity. I have four girls, right? So my mission is to make sure women have opportunities that they are, haven't been afforded. And that is my, I mean, I'm the father of four girls. <laughs> so that is my next obsession, is how do we lead that charge from the front? How do we take an animation industry that lacks in diversity, substantially lacks in diversity. How do we take some of those old animation techniques and teach a whole new generation of animators to come in and create films that inspire the world? And uh, we're getting after it. I, I think everybody knows crystal clear Kobe's going to get whatever Kobe wants. That's crystal <laughs> clear, man. Brother, appreciate you for coming Thank out. You. And truly, this has been a blast. Make Thank some you. noise. Kobe Bryant. Thank you. I got a gift for you, man. I want to give you a gift. Thank you. Right. Let me give you this gift. All right. Let me give you this gift. You have it. So first one I'm going to give you is this. This is something that you represent, and we have to go get your size. And it's just saying that post-game, you are now an entrepreneur. So we're giving you a shirt that says, I'm ah, an entrepreneur. Word, okay, that's yours. Word, okay? word, word, word. And next one, word. you said script. So we went and got a Star Wars Force <laughs> Awakens script signed by J.J. Abrams, <laughs> brother, because oh, man. That's space oh, that's amazing. Studio. I hope Bro, you enjoyed it. Thank truly, you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming on, man. Thank truly, you. Man, thank you for coming on. Thank it's you. been a blast. Thank you. Everybody, make those Kobe Bryant. Thank you. I love it. Oh, no. Love, man. Love. Thank you. Love.